fit test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between Harry and Andrea, two students who have just finished their final exams. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Andrea, how are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? Well, I've been catching up on sleep too, but I've got a lot to do before I leave for England. Perhaps you could give me some advice. I've got a lot of things I can't possibly take back with me, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, it depends on what sort of things they are and whether you're thinking of giving them away or selling them. Well, almost everything. Furniture, the fridge and other kitchen stuff that I bought from the previous tenant. But the new people have already got what they need, so they're not interested in buying stuff from me. I can't afford to give it away, but I'm not sure how to sell it all. Oh, and there are some clothes and books as well. Why can't you take them? The books are really heavy. It's so expensive if you exceed the airline baggage allowance. And the clothes just won't all fit in my suitcase. It's amazing how much stuff I've accumulated since I've been here. Anyway... I don't think I'll need as many summer clothes in England as I have here in Australia. I see. Well, there are several alternatives. First of all, you could put up notices around the university about the books. You know, on the notice boards in the Student Union Building and in the Economics Department. Anywhere second and third year students will see them. People are always keen to buy cheap textbooks. OK, what, what should I say on the notices? Just put the titles, authors and price you want, your name of course, and maybe put your phone number on those little tear-off tags. That's a good idea. And what about the furniture? You could try doing the same thing, but usually students are away all summer, so they don't want to buy furniture now. Another place to try might be a second-hand shop. Someone from the shop will usually come around and give you a free quote, and then you can decide. But you don't usually get much money for that sort of stuff. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Another alternative is to put an advertisement in the trading post. Do you know that paper? It comes out every week advertising things people want to sell. You have to pay to put the advert in and then hope people phone. Give them as much information as possible and if they're interested, invite them to come and have a look. The hard part is agreeing on a price. No, I haven't seen the trading post. But I should have a look at it, and I could advertise the fridge, the microwave, and the furniture. But the kitchen stuff isn't really that good. You know, old cutlery, a few pots and pans, and some plates and things. What shall I do with them? Well, another option is to donate the kitchen things to a charity shop. You know, like the Salvation Army or St Vincent de Paul. Why don't you get a second-hand shop to give you a quote first? Yes, I could do that. Find out how much they'll give me and then decide whether to sell them or give them away. But I've still got the clothes. A charity shop will take them too, as long as they're in good condition. 
And even though you don't get any money, at least you know that someone who really deserves some help has benefited. That's a good point. I'll advertise the expensive stuff, the furniture, and donate the clothes and kitchen stuff. Let's go and buy a trading post and you can help me write the advert. Well, actually, I'm interested in buying the fridge and the microwave, depending on the price, of course. OK, a y let's see how good you are at bargaining. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a local radio program about fighting air pollution in Canadian towns. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the information roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the 25th of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June 6th. In case you weren't around for the last one, This is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000, and it's likely to grow, unless we do something. And... It's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. And it's the tiny particles and ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities, but researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day is to accept what we call the commuter challenge and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, 
you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern, improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90 percent? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog, and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans for Clean Air Day events. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Dave, and his tutor about a project that Dave has done about work placements. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, Dave. Come on in and take a seat. Hi, Dr. Green. Thanks. Oh, hang on a minute. I'll just find the first draft of your project paper and we can have a look at it together. Now, yours is the one on work placement, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So what made you choose that for your project? Well... I suppose it was because sending students off to various companies for work experience seems to be such a typical part of educational courses these days. I mean, even school kids get to do it. But I felt everyone just kind of assumes it's a good thing. And I guess I wanted to find out if that's the case. But you don't look at schools or colleges, right? You've stuck to university placement schemes. Yeah, well, I quickly found that I had to limit my research. Otherwise, the area was just too big. Do you think that was OK? I think it's very sensible, especially as the objectives might be very different. So how many schemes did you look at? Well, I sent out about 150 questionnaires altogether, you know, 50 of each to university authorities, students and companies. And I got responses from 15 educational institutions and uh, 30 students in 11 individual companies. Great. That sounds like a good sample. And who did you send your company questionnaires to? Well, the idea was to have them done by the students' line managers. But sometimes they were filled in by the human resources manager or even the owner of the company. Right. I didn't find a full list anywhere. So I think it's very important to provide that, really. You can put it as an appendix at the back. Right. I've got a record of all the respondents, so that'll be easy. I hope other things were OK. I mean... I've already put such a lot of work into this project, identifying the companies and so on. Oh, I can tell. I think you've done a good job overall. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. I thought your questionnaires were excellent, and you'd obviously done lots of background reading. But there were a few problems with the introduction. First of all, I think you need to make some slight changes to the organisation of your information there. At present, it's a bit confused. OK. What did you have in mind? Well, you write quite a bit about work placement in general, but you never explain what you mean by the term. So you think I should give a definition? Exactly. And the introduction is the place to do it. And then, look, you start talking about what's been written on the topic, but it's all a bit mixed up with your own project. So do you think it would be better to have two sections there, like a survey of the literature as the introduction, and then a separate section on the aims of my research? I do. You can include your methods for collecting data in the second section too, it would be much clearer for your reader. You know, establish the background first, then how your work relates to it. It would flow quite nicely then. Yes, I see what you mean. Anyway, moving on. I like the way you've grouped your findings into three main topic areas. Well, it became very obvious from the questionnaires that the preparation stage was really important for the whole scheme to work. So I had to look at that first and I found a huge variation between the different institutions, as you saw. I was wondering if you could give a summary at the end of this stage of what you consider to be the best practice you found. I think that would be very helpful. Right, I'll just make a note of that. What did you think of my second set of findings, on key skills development? For me, this is the core of my whole project, really. And you've handled it very well. I wouldn't want you to make any changes... You've already got a nice final focus on good practice there. Thanks. Right. Now, I think the last part, which deals with the reasons why students don't learn... What, the constraints on learning chapter? Yes, that's the one. I think you need to refer to the evidence from your research a bit more closely here. You know, maybe you could illustrate it with quotations from the questionnaires or even use any extracts from a student diary if you can and refer back to what you've written about good practice. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about developments in public transport in large cities. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. That big cities around the world are getting bigger is a clear trend. This situation is going to make the issue of transport increasingly important. Cities cannot work if their people and their visitors cannot move around. This means that public transport is vital to the success of cities. And yet, private car ownership is increasing all the time. Can these two facts be contained in the same reality? Isn't the car slowly but surely strangling the city? But we must acknowledge it does have genuine benefits. Having said that, the fact that car owners can escape to the mountains is of little relevance to the issue of daily city life, in which we need to do things like ferry heavy shopping and luggage around, something the car, of course, is invaluable for. But the so-called family car 
is rarely occupied by a family, just a single driver taking up a lot of road space. It's not only the car that clogs up our roads, of course. Trucks are heavy, noisy and smelly intruders. But it's hard to persuade companies to opt for rail freight rather than road. They argue that it is cheaper and more flexible, and trucks are undoubtedly able to go when you want, where you want. The cost claim is false, however. Truck companies don't hold themselves responsible for the environmental costs they incur, nor are they keen to calculate the time spent on repairs or delays. So, this is our first challenge, the sheer volume of traffic. If we compare three developed and urbanised countries, we can see interesting differences. The UK, for example, has just over 20 million cars, one for every three people approximately, and nearly three million buses and trucks. These figures sound very high, but in fact the Netherlands, although only a little over a quarter the population, has more vehicles per head of population. Meanwhile, Germany, bigger than both other countries put together, actually outstrips either in terms of vehicles per head of population. Now, there is no correlation between these figures and the percentages of journeys made on public transport. This means that the route to better public transport use is not abolishing the car, but rather making public transport better. Not surprisingly, where people can choose, they choose the thing they prefer, not the thing they don't. How do people judge public transport? Well, a major survey was carried out this year, indicating that there are many aspects, from clean interiors of buses to the proximity of routes to homes and workplaces. Fair prices is a complex issue and needs to be accounted with car costs. What people seem to find most frustrating is scheduling. If the route doesn't pass their departure point when it suits them, they'll drive instead. The issue of personal safety seems to have reduced in urgency with better lighting at stops and CCTV. Now, various measures are being taken in a number of major cities, all designed to increase the appeal of public transport and thus to persuade car users to leave their cars behind and free up the city's roads. Among these is bringing in smart cards. These are purchased in advance and mean passengers spend less time waiting to buy tickets and board buses and trains particularly when switching across transport modes within the same journey. Another initiative is the use of computers in managing scheduling with greater efficiency. But such logistical measures are not sufficient in themselves, and indeed the benefits that they bring are often less apparent to passengers than to transport managers. From the passenger's point of view, the fact that buses are becoming more comfortable is significant, because it brings them more in line with the car. Delays and diversions are, of course, deeply irritating for passengers. Even if these can't be eliminated, ensuring that passengers have more detailed information available to them will help to reduce their sense of stress. We often associate public transport with inner-city travel, but of direct benefit to passengers are systems such as taxi-sharing and dial-a-bus, which provide more flexible options for suburban journeys. And finally, nothing really significant can happen without a shift in people's mindsets. The way we travel is an expression of our values about many things. Companies operating public transport are slowly but surely finding it possible to sell their services as a public-spirited alternative to the car, as awareness of environmental issues has increased radically in the last few years. Overall, then, 
This combination of steps and changes has a good chance of shifting the city out of the car and onto the bus and train. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.